My name is Gladys Carrion, and I am looking, I'm the moderator of this panel, and I'm really looking forward to a very lively and informative conversation. So we are going to try our best, even with limited mics, to have a conversation. Um, and uh, not only a conversation among our panelists, but we really would like to have a Q&A and have a conversation with you, the audience members. I've had the honor and challenge of serving as the state's commissioner for children and family services and the uh, distinction of serving as commissioner for the city's children's services. I am probably the only person who has uh, been crazy enough to do both of these jobs. In both of these positions, I was responsible for leading the state's child welfare and juvenile justice system and the city's uh, child welfare and juvenile justice system. Both of these systems are systems of last resort for our most vulnerable children and youth. These are the children and families that every system has failed. And we will be talking about vulnerable children today and trying to learn why we failed them and how we can do better. Our panelists are experts, practitioners, clinicians who will share their knowledge, insights, and experience working with vulnerable children and adolescents. Are there groups of children and adolescents who are more at risk of not getting the right services and why? Why do they end up in the systems I ran? And why were all these children black and brown? Let's not ever forget that. So who are they and why? And what should we be doing? And many of our panelists have been doing the kinds of services and supports that are inclusive and responsive to the needs of all children. And I'm hoping what we'll do today is really identify, in the very short time we have, identify what works. Our panelists have crafted and identified and piloted services that better serve the needs of our most vulnerable children and adolescents. How do we make sure that services are inclusive, that services respond to what the needs are, that they take into consideration those young people, those children who are extra vulnerable? How do we serve them? Are we intervening soon enough to make a difference? We want our panelists and we want you to really identify concrete approaches, intervention and supports, and ask those questions that will get to what improves outcomes for children and adolescents. What should be part of a healthy childhood and adolescence. What's that roadmap? What do we need to do? So I'm really looking forward. I'll introduce very quickly our panelists. You all have their bios. So I'll start with Ashby Dodge. She's the Chief Clinical Officer of the Trevor Project. We have Dr. Jamil Malti Hader, lecturer at Columbia University. We have Paul Barrett, Project Manager for Safe Horizon and their Young Men's Initiative, Young Men of Color Initiative. And we have Dr. John Siever, Director of Special Programs at Mount Sinai Adolescent Health Center. And I will just tell you right now that that's the right intervention. That's the right support and that's the right services. I have a long, long history of making sure that the young people in every job that I've ever held, and I've had many, um, went to the clinic. Uh, Dr. Diaz does incredible work and that's what we should be doing and replicating. One of the things, there are lots of interventions we need, but replicating, it shouldn't just be one. We should have it all over the city and all over the country, because that's what works for young people. That's what makes a difference. So I'm gonna start by asking each of the panelists to share a very short introduction of the, into their work, and also really focus on what works, what are the challenges they've had, and what's worked for them in really trying to work with young people, with children, to improve their outcomes. So can we start with you? Sure. Hi. Uh, it's such an honor to be included in this panel. Um, I'm the Chief Clinical Officer at the Trevor Project, and we are the only national organization providing suicide prevention and crisis intervention services to lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and questioning young people uh, under the age of 25. 
it used to be that we um, said it was ages eight, you know, 10 to 24, but we've gotten so many young people um, you know, under the age of eight even calling us that, um, that we've just now said under 25. Um, our work is to really, um, we have a 24-7 lifeline that is a suicide uh, prevention lifeline for uh, anyone in the country. We also have a crisis chat and crisis text program. Um, we really gear our services toward um, really connecting with the LGBTQ young people in this country and ensuring that they have a place to go and someone to talk to if and when they are feeling suicidal. Uh, we also have a pretty um, robust training and education program that we, uh, we work with the Department of Education in New York City and, and uh, various um, educational institutions all over the country to kind of train on LGBTQ competent care um, and gatekeeper trainings for suicide prevention. Great. Thank you. Jamil? Hi, so I am a professor of social work at Columbia, but mainly my career is a social worker at heart. And so my clinical work has always been with children and families, mostly in the foster care system, but also kids who have been um, neglect or abuse within the community and um, trauma related to intergenerations um, here in the U.S. and abroad and at home in Puerto Rico where I'm from. Um, and talking a little bit about your question of what works, obviously Monsina's Adolescent Health Center, I agree with you, it's a perfect example of what holistic services are. And unfortunately, we don't have that many examples of that. Um, but I would say that, that in, a, in a conference like this where we have been talking about evidence-based practice and research, I think we can go to the basics, looking at the person in their context, which is what social work talks about. When you look at a child who has gone through trauma or abuse or neglect, rather than just treating the child, treating and then understanding the circumstances of that child and what has affected them to the point of coming to get services from you. So I think that's one strategy that we can talk about today. Paul? Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Paul Barrett. I am the um, project manager um, for Safe Horizons um, efforts to enhance services for young men of color. Um, so in addition to running the five um, child advocacy centers across the city, um, Safe Horizon um, runs a number of programs that are all geared towards serving victims of crime and abuse. And so um, we um, believe we are the largest victims assistance agency in the um, country, um, even though our services are focused um, within the five boroughs of New York City. And so we view ourselves as thought leaders and very well positioned to serve victims of crime. But um, my work really um, is geared towards um, our own internal efforts to, work, to enhance our services for a historically underserved population. So young um, boys and adolescent um, black and Latino youth. Um, we know that across um, a variety of categories of victimizations, young black and Latino um, boys and young men are most likely to experience a variety of um, forms of harm, um, but also um, they are in many cases the least likely to receive or have access to victim services. And so my work is to engage with our own program areas, including um, our community offices that are based around the city, our um, domestic violence shelters that are also based around the city, um, and a number of our other programs to work with that, uh, program staff to be able to better serve and reach um, both the young men and the boys themselves and their families. And so um, I'll talk more about this, but I think one of the key things is recognizing um, that young boys and men of color live within families and communities. And so leveraging those relationships with the families, with the communities that they live in and with um, as, a, um, as a key lever to better engage and serve them. Because um, as I think a couple panelists in the last panel discussed, um, there are several communities, not just people, but communities that have historic trauma from the systems that are um, supposed to serve them. And so if we can begin to acknowledge that and intervene to be able to leverage the families to better serve the youth, um, there are a lot of opportunities to improve there. So I will pause at that point. <laughs> John? Hi, good morning. My name is John Stever. I'm one of the physicians at the Adolescent Health Center at Mount Sinai, who you've all heard a lot about our program today. Um, my role at the center is um, multi-hatted. Um, people will often say to me, 
uh, when I say I work with adolescents, oh, you must be a fill in the blank. And the answer is usually, well, yes, I do a little of everything. I'm a little bit of a psychologist. I'm a little bit of a psychiatrist. I'm a medical doctor. I'm a social worker. Uh, I've even been sort of a legal advisor occasionally. Um, <laughs> And so we do a ton of work, and my role within the center really is to focus on several specific populations within our center. So I run a fabulous sort of uh, salad of working with gender nonconforming youth. I work with children and young adults who are HIV positive, both either acquiring it during their teenage years or having acquired it in uh, during uh, birth at pregnancy, and now they are as teenagers dealing with their diagnosis. Uh, I work with our teen parent program uh, as well, and then I also work uh, heavily with our HIV prevention um, programs, which include uh, groups such as youth who have been trafficked, high-risk sexual uh, risk groups, and um, as you can imagine, some of these other groups also are part of that, so the transgender, youth, um, uh, we work very hard to try and get the message across about um, preventing HIV. Uh, and so that's kind of what I do, and I would say that um, the group of children that are sort of most at risk that I work with are these kids, and they're the kids that are often we think of as being really on the edge, whether they're on the edge of poverty, um, people have talked about race, sex, gender, gender expression, uh, support, family support, social support, uh, and uh, education, knowledge. So working with kids who aren't necessarily going to be making it all the way through grad school, but who are just gonna struggle to get through high school. How do I work with these kids and do that? And um, we can talk some more about some of the, the data. We're trying to bring a, a rigorous approach to what we do. Um, with um, evidence-based uh, within our clinic and then bringing national data to our program and figuring out what works best. Thank you. So I'm wondering, what are the challenges? What are your frustrations? Um, are we intervening early enough? Are we not serving a certain segment of the population effectively? Are there just not sufficient programs or the right programs? What have, has been your experience and what drives you crazy? Should we go in, in order? Okay, <laughs> sure. What drives us crazy? Um, you know, and I think going back to the theme of, of kind of going back to the basics um, and, and even in folding in what the previous panel was talking about, um, about provider bias, about self-awareness or lack of the lack thereof, um, really understanding the community you're working with, whatever that community is, and being able to connect with someone, I think is, the, is the, really the first step to care, um, whether it be a parent, a teacher, a guidance counselor, a nurse, a therapist, a uh, doctor, um, people need to understand understand diverse identities and, and situations um, in order to really provide proper care. And so that's something that we see a lot. Folks come to us. Now, granted, they're coming to us at this, you know, hard intervention point, you know, being suicidal, mm. we also try to work in upstream prevention so that we do a lot of trainings and education uh, programs so that folks don't have to get to that point. Um, so that's something that we really try to, to incorporate into our services. Um, but, but the lack of competent care, um, mm. culturally competent care, is, is a real problem. And also the, the only other thing that we really um, focus on especially in suicide uh, intervention and prevention, is that direct communication, not being afraid of sitting with someone where they are, not being afraid to ask uh, a youth if they are, do they want to die? Are you going to kill yourself? Do you, are you thinking of killing yourself today? And that's something that's really hard to address, and a lot of um, the therapeutic uh, models that we've worked with so far or that we've seen come in, you know, folks are afraid to ask that or they think they're going to give them the idea of, mm -hmm. of being suicidal. Um, and so the youth we work with really um, tell us that they really appreciate the direct questioning. So let me take that and, and ask you, so what would solve that? So the lack of competently trained uh, practitioners in the field. So where do we start in changing that? How do we enhance the skill sets of people who are providing these services and supports? 
What do we do? Is it the schools of social work? Is it the medical school or the law schools? What do we need to change differently for people to have this skill set and understanding of how we really provide competent, inclusive, and responsive services? Paul? Yeah, so, so I, don't, uh, I don't know that I um, would say that I have the solution for all uh, underserved populations. <laughs> I'm <but> disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what we have done at Safe Horizon is to um, really pool the resources that exist in terms of the organizations, the groups, the people who are and have been working um, for years, for decades, to serve young men of color. And so gathering them, um, pooling the resources that we have, and what we have done is designed a training that we are uh, we've piloted with our own staff and that we are engaging partners like ACS and other um, victim service um, provider organizations and agencies throughout the city to be able to train staff we, because we know, for, for instance, um, our most typical client that we might see in our offices is, uh, is a mother, a guardian um, that has experienced domestic or intimate partner violence. And so when we are saying that we recognize that there are young boys and men who have experienced harm um, we know that our staff don't have the same experience or exposure to working with um, young men and the potential harms and the victimizations that they experience. Although they experience all the same that everybody else does, it's not a separate, mm -hmm. because they're humans too. Um, so we have made the effort to um, try to bring those resources and bring training to our own staff and our partners to be able to have them exposed to those, um, ex uh, to those ex the experiences that young men that have been harmed um, have. And so I think that um, to, to your point, I do think it's the efforts not only of organizations but of schools of social work to do work to reach out to grassroots organizations who have been doing that um, work but on a, with a much lower profile and bringing the expertise that they have to broader audiences as well. Um, so I think that's one thing. Great. John, were you trained in medical school to do this work? I would say in, in medical school, um, I got some. But it really was in fellowship where um, I learned a lot of this kind of work. And so I would say that for medical schools, and you know, I'm really, um, Mount Sinai's medical school is really quite spectacular in having trainings at uh, their first year, their second year, third and fourth years throughout many of these kinds of topics that we're talking about. And then when um, kids, come through, kids, sorry, medical students come through, <laughs> uh, they get younger and younger, right? Um, when medical students are coming through our clinic and we are teaching them about medicine, but we are also spending a lot of time teaching them how to talk with uh, youth. And we, you know, use um, various um, mnemonics like the, the heads exam, home education activities, drug, sex, suicide. Um, which I can spin off really quickly there, but we go through it very slowly with the residents and teach them how to connect. And I'm always telling the students, I don't care how long you spend with this person today. The point is not to learn that azithromycin is for chlamydia treatment. The point today is to learn about how did that young person get this mm -hmm. STD? How do you approach it in a way that is non-judgmental? That that we are saying we are here to help you and okay, the next step, which is now about, you've tested for one STD, let's move on to things like HIV testing and how do you prevent something that I cannot fix with a simple pill. So I th do think um, at the medical school level it's important, but even then continuing that through training um, and I would say all disciplines need that because um, we have surgeons who may not feel that they need to get into the sort of the very uh, softer, more emotional, more um, gentle, social things. But then you realize that many of my kids are gonna go for surgeries, gonna go for an evaluation with um, a, a specialist. And I want those specialists to be sensitive to the LGBT kids, the gender non-conforming kids, the kids who have HIV who may not have disclosed that diagnosis to a parent. And so, um, yes, it needs to happen at multiple levels and often. Jamil? So I, I am gonna give you an example of my own practice. So working within foster care, about 80% 80, 80 of children in foster care have a mental health diagnosis, um, which means these kids obviously need support and help, but also the foster parents need it. 
Because if you take a child and not know that that child was sexually abused and they don't want to touch you and they scream every time you get close and in proximity to them, you're not being able to be a foster parent if you don't have those tools of information. So going back to the basics means appropriate assessments, asking the questions of what happened in that house, training the, parent to under the foster parent to understand how do you manage a child that was physically or sexually abused. Um, the same with culture, like you were talking about. If I have a child, and that doesn't mean a Latino child has to be placed in a Latino family, but if a Latino child is placed in a, in a non-Latino family that doesn't practice the same culture, then I have to give the tools to that family to understand what are cultural things that are important to them, from food, music, holidays. Um, you don't know how many parents don't stay in foster care fostering because they gave the wrong food to the child and then the biological parent had an argument with them and that was, that was it. So we don't retain these parents because we don't train them well and we don't train them well because we don't spend the time on the basics. So I think thorough assessments where we ask those questions, where we take the person into consideration and their context are extremely important. I think that's so uh, true, particularly uh, when we, when, you know, I always felt that the state really in the city, uh, when we remove children from their home, whether it's uh, for, for uh, you know, dependency, children in foster care, or when we move them for juvenile justice, we're raising them. Mm -hmm. Right, we're raising them. And the question is, what do we need to do different so that we have different outcomes? And all of you have interacted with the different systems. And I imagine that you've experienced some success and some, some challenges. And I'm wondering, what would you change in these systems that are responsible for the children, the most vulnerable children in, in our society? What would make your job easier to be more effective? Well, I just wanted to hop on that as well as just um, something from the previous question which the other the previous panel discussed which was training the police force um, in, in more culturally competent care I know that at Trevor we we deal a lot with um, when emergency services or police have to come to do an intervention with a youth um, if if they are not trained in how to handle anyone who's gender nonconforming or any of our trans folks um, a lot of communities of color it's it it's obviously it can be a nightmare. Um, and I think that most people have dealt with this. So, um, you know, we're trying to figure out as a very small organization, even though we're national, how do we address training um, police and emergency services to be, for us, LGBTQ competent and understand and, and recognize folks' gender identity and, and pronouns and how to, how to address the situation without putting someone in further danger. So that's something that's really big for us that we are kind of trying to work with on, on the daily. John? Um, I, I, that's a tough question because so many, you, one of the earlier sort of questions was when does some of this stuff need to start? Um, and I really feel like, and people have alluded to this uh, previously, is that often it um, starts at the family. When these kids are, you know, born and growing up. And so questions about, um, uh, sex and uh, drugs and school and um, relationships, these aren't things that should be suddenly discussed at age 12, 15, mm -hmm. 18. That vote has already left. I'm playing catch up at this point. These things really need to start at a much earlier age. And I'm not talking about, obviously, I'm not talking about having a graphic discussion about how babies are made with a three year old but you need to start talking about relationships and love and support and respect and all of these things at a very young age so that by the time somebody is 12 and talking about you know, liking somebody or things like that, that, that young girls uh, and young boys certainly know what respect is and understand what diversity is and understand about boundaries and relationships and all these things and then a lot of my work would sort of disappear, frankly, which um, uh, I wouldn't like, but, but it would be much better for uh, our society. So if, if I could change something, I would say start at a very young age. And that's one of the things we're trying to do with our teen parent program is really work with um, young new parents and bring them skills and tools that they can have to be good parents for their children so that we're breaking some of these um, uh, uh, issues and factors that keep these kids sort of down and, and oppressed, in a sense. Two generation programs. <laughs> generation programs, and, and you know, I 
love seeing, when I'm working uh, in the, with our transgender program, I sort of love seeing when the parents are there. So many times, many of our kids who come don't bring their parents, and they're allowed to often by New York state law that says you can have confidential services, but that a lot of the trans kids bring their families and to invite them in and work with them, and even as simple as things like when, when a young trans woman says, you know, she and her, and then the parent keeps saying he and him, and I get to say, actually, I think she said she. And, you know, <laughs> trying to be very gentle and bring about some change in a way that's inviting to the parents. Um, you know, little steps, but it-, it Important it, steps. It, it, important, yeah. yeah. Paul? I think we in this room are familiar with the term trauma-informed, and I think um, it can become just really easy to just kind of gloss past like what that means. And I do think, um, to your point, Ashby, uh, many of our partners who actually see the um, young people that we serve before we ever get to them um, don't have that same um, comfort or um, awareness of that. And so um, I think about the, we have partners in the criminal justice space, we have partners um, in schools and hospitals. And so um, for the teacher that sees that young person that has been harmed, um, or sees that young person that has um, been sleeping in class for like the last week straight um, to be able to identify those as potential um, signs to ask the extra question, you know, um, how are things going at home? Or um, if you have that young person in your class, uh, I just keep thinking about schools because I've um, been in conversations with a couple local school partners. But um, if you have that young person who has been um, steadily declining, he was getting straight A's in the beginning of the school year, but his grades are declining, to ask the extra question um, and recognize those things as um, not just poor performance, but potential signs of trauma. Uh, um, and so I think that our, uh, one of our jobs as experts and as folks who have the um, awareness and understanding of what trauma is and how it can play out in young people's lives is to, um, to bridge that, un um, that knowledge gap with our partners who, um, who do see the youth before we have the opportunity to see them and work with them so that they can um, either engage in those preliminary conversations or alert us sooner to be able to connect to them. So I think that's one, um, that's one piece. Jamil? So I, I think resiliency yesterday was talked about a lot in the conference and in, 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 in my opinion, a little bit in our black and white terms. Um, in research, we often see resiliency as no homelessness, no symptomatology. And I think changing the, the conversation to talk about resiliency, if you have a homeless um, young adult or adolescent, that it's going to try to get health services at Mount Sinai Health Adolescent Health Center and is living in the streets, that's resiliency. Because at least he's trying and he's working through what he's dealing with. And so I think shifting the conversation to absolutes that are not necessarily realistic for many of our youth and our children, it's an important um, move forward. And also collaboration of care. Not every place has all, these, all the programs in one place. But we can certainly work together to communicate what a case is going through, what are the next steps, to also help each other as in, in a multidisciplinary setting like we are here today, in training each other about things that we know because I'm a social worker, maybe a lawyer doesn't necessarily recognize trauma or know how to talk about trauma, but then training our fellow workers in ways on how to talk about trauma with a case, for example, of an accompanied minor who was sexually abused. Um, so I think training the trainers is very important, but also in the context of collaboration. So rather than a hierarchy mm -hmm. of, I'm the expert in this, we're collaborating together, this is gonna make everyone's work much easier. Do you have something to add? I just wanted to add one other thing about, um, you know, when John, when, when we're talking about um, doing all this work with the family, that's absolutely correct, is really starting at home and seeing if they can get on board. The underside of that that we see a lot, because we're dealing with folks all over the country, and, and I, you know, we forget oftentimes, because we're based in New York City or Los Angeles or wherever, um, is that, you know, to have a, a young trans, you know, person come in and that is able to bring in their parents is like monumental because most of the folks we deal with, they, un unlike other communities, they do not connect with their, with their family or, or home life in terms of their identity. So uh, most times their parents, their family, their siblings are hating them or kicking them out so they're mostly ho um, dealing with homelessness. Um, so it's, uh, to, to be able to come in and train those folks and get, get the parents on board, I think is, is huge. So I'm gonna have one last, oh, John, you were gonna oh, say I something. Just, 
Uh, um, and I think your point is spot on. And I think one of the take home messages that I had written down in my pre talk notes was um, being, and people have talked about this, being uh, patient centric and patient informed. So, yes, I love it when I see parents, but I'm also acutely aware that many parents and families are not as supportive as they could be. And my goal is to help the kid in front of me and you know, like let them lead what I, let them lead me to help them find the services that they require. And so if that's with parents, great. If that's, if the parents are a, a roadblock, then let's move them aside and we work with the kids. Mm -hmm. Hopefully at some point we'll be able to, but yes. Absolutely. Great. So I am. I have one last question, but I want to go over my Q and A. So I want you to think about this question. When I was state commissioner, I had a budget of five billion dollars. When I was city commissioner, I had a budget of three billion dollars. Very, very little about that money when I was state commissioner. Ninety-eight percent of it, in the juvenile justice budget that I had, went toward facilities. Right. It didn't go to preventive services. Right. Uh, it didn't go to those uh, parents. Uh, it didn't go to foster parents. It went uh, on my child welfare budget, which was a billion dollars in of itself. So I'm going to give each of you, I want you to think about that. Uh, I'm going to give each of you $10 million. I want to know what you're going to do with $10 million that would improve outcomes and have healthy outcomes for our children and young people. And we're going to take some questions now. Any questions for our panel? Hello? Okay. Hi, my name is Max. I'm a uh, clinical ther uh, social worker and I work with um, adult survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault. But before I did that work, I worked in New York City foster care for about four years um, with JCCA and a bunch of adolescents. So everyone here really covers the foster care world pretty well, I think. And I just was curious for everyone's kind of opinion and Gladys, yours too. Um, you know, my experience in the foster care system is, was not good. A lot of burnout, obviously. Um, and yes, they are the most vulnerable population in the city. And if we're talking about ending violence against kids, I think we have to talk about, a bunch of people talked about it, getting all pissed off, um, t taking, believing children, listening to them, taking them seriously, what they say. They try to talk about the abuse they hear, especially to their parents or caregivers, coaches, and nobody wants to talk about it or hear it. Um, especially the adults. And I think what uh, John Pickett said too about being able to talk about sex is also really important. So we're not really good role models, at least the, the leadership in foster care, in my experience. I left foster care because my experience doing the, the home visits, the face-to-face -face contacts with children in care who have serious attachment, abandonment issues, loss, um, everyone, my supervisors, the administrators, the higher-ups at my agencies, did not want to talk about attachment, abandonment, um, loss, intergenerational trauma. They cared about getting the uh, home visit form signed, you know, the paperwork, the funding. Um, so I'm wondering how on a uh, systemic level within foster care and child welfare, um, and I think it also carries off into the educational system, the administrators there, um, you know, how do we force systems to be trauma informed? How do we hold them accountable if they don't? Um, you know, I've seen documentaries about, like, uh, I'm trying to think of, like, schools that have a uh, ACEs-informed thing or trauma-focused. I'm just curious how you guys think, because you guys are leaders and administrators and, you know, informed people, how do we get large-scale systems that people empower to um, care about vulnerable kids and to make them accountable? So before... Before I answer that, does any of the panelists members want to say anything? So I, I would say two things that come to mind. Um, the, tic, the stigmatizing the system. And as you had a, a, a negative experience, there are also 100 good experiences that are never told. And in my experience of research, there's a lot of foster parents that get a bad rap because people think they do it for the money. And the people who are working in the foster care system know that it's not enough money to deal with the issues that they have to deal with. Oftentimes, in the research that I have done, 
foster parents foster because they have an empty nest, because they want to love somebody, because their children moved out of the home, because they're widows or they're, they don't have a job anymore and they want to fulfill that time with something productive. So I, I think as, as many bad stories we have, which we often see in the news and are important to be told, there's also value in, in sharing and balancing those stories with the ones that are successful and positive so that we bring a, a, a better attitude towards the system, which it's already a horrible system given the circumstances of why these children are removed. The other part about uh, that is that the work is mechanical. So we start working and saying, you know, we have to target 35 cases today. How are you really gonna work with 35 cases of children who have been abused and neglected? And so until the system reholds in a way where we don't think about the work as mechanical and approaching numbers and you know, filing cases, we're not gonna really do comprehensive work. You know, um, we, one good thing that I can you know, uh, say is that the number of children, both in the city and the state that are in care has been reduced substantially. When I first started doing this work many, many years ago, there were 45,000 children in out-of-home care. Today, there are 8,500 children in out-of-home care in the city of New York, and that's really important. The work that had the investments in prevention and really diverting children from coming into system. And so that's really important. I think that it is a struggle, and certainly our systems can do better. Uh, but there has been tremendous transformational work done to improve our systems. But what makes systems better is people like you holding us accountable. That's what's really important, where children don't have a voice. And I often said that when I went to Albany and I tried to lobby um, to really get more investments in the right places in the systems, there was no one there advocating for our children. There were lobbyists there for AT&T, you know, lobbyists for all sorts of banks, but there weren't lobbyists for our children. And our children need to have voices. Um, and so it's a shared responsibility to improve these systems. It's just not one system, one agency, one person. It really takes everyone working together to make the ch kinds of changes. This is hard work. People burn out. They, they are traumatized doing this work. And so we need to invest in them to be able to do better by our children and families. But most important, we need to prevent children from coming into these systems in the first place. And we need to invest in their communities. 98% of my budget was predetermined to support facilities, which I closed 21 of, right? That money should have been invested, which is what I worked really hard, in communities, in developing the infrastructure that supports children and family. We talk about children. Children grow up in the context of families. And many don't have families, so we have to create and help support for them to have families and the supports they need. It can't be a system responsibility. It is a society's responsibility. Okay, next question over here. Hi, so my name is Charlena Powell and I'm a member of Voices of Women, Milagro Stay Worldwide, and I've followed you, Ms. Carillon, for a while now, so I'm really great, I'm really happy to see you uh, moderate this panel. Um, I'm glad to see that the panel is addressing the issue of financial money and being more, um, just, just talking about it more freely, and I think it's, it's necessary to talk about the monies that are going into these actions that are being progressed. Um, I'm particularly working on uh, introductory bill 1739, and it's talking about domestic violence, um, people who are leaving shelters, and where are they going? And um, I looked over the bill, over the steps that it takes to actually introduce it, get it passed, get it put to the mayor's attention, and I also looked at the financial analysis of the budget. The budget is zero dollars. So they're using other resources of money that's, uh, in, in particularly HRA, we're talking about approaching systems that um, domestic violence survivors face when they leave, abuse, um, when they leave their abuser. Uh, they're using existing money that already is in their budget, but they're not clarifying what it is, that what, how that money is being allocated, and really the performance of the bill. 
because I really think that if you have more monies directed towards a specific action from the beginning, then the people who are actually doing the work will be more dedicated to providing those data, you know, accurately, and then the long-term longevity of the bill, like how, how does it trickle down you know, years after? So um, I guess my question is, what is the, the ratio between the budget that starts in the beginning of a bill and how does that affect the performance of it actually working and then the systems, you know, it potentially it affects the families and children? Well, let me tell you that the easiest way to pass a bill in New York is to say that there is no cost impact. The minute you say that something's gonna cost money, it, it never goes through OMB or the budget office. Um, you know, to respond to your question, um, in part, we have a lot of money. The question is, how are we using that money, right? What are our priorities? You know, really, how we need to stop doing what doesn't work, and then we'll have a lot of money. You know, one of the reasons that I focused when I was state commissioner in closing juvenile justice facilities, and everyone said how hard that was, and so a sane person wouldn't start there to make change, but it was where the money was. And so in order to free up money to be able to do the things that you are talking about, that we've all talked about, you need to stop doing what doesn't work and reinvest money in what does work. And that's really hard to do, but that's what you need to do. It's difficult to get more money, especially for children. You know, you think, my God, that should be so easy. Well, it's not. There isn't a constituency that's as powerful as it needs to be, whether in Albany or in the city council, to really invest in children and families in our communities. And that's what we need to do. We need to redesign how we are using the monies that we have and invest them in what makes a difference. And so I'm gonna go, so we have a couple of minutes, and I'm gonna ask each of you to tell me how you would use that money that I just gave you. Um, I guess I would use the money um, to somewhat uh, for data, um, because if you've got data, then you can really make decisions about what works. So for example, we started tracking our, um, as it's a little tiny thing, what percentage of our HIV positive kids on medications are virally suppressed? And does our model support that? And um, the good news is, so I can leave on a good news is, our model does support that, and my viral suppression rate in my clinic is better than the national average for kids of the same um, ages. So, but there's no way to know that unless you're going to, to get data. So data. having money to get data, to figure out what works and what doesn't work in the long run, I think will save money and you'll get more done, apropos um, that mm -hmm. young woman's comments. Paul, what would you do with all that money? Um, I would invest it in, well, besides the money that I would reinvest in communities of color and other marginalized communities in the city, um, I would invest it in training, um, training our partners, training um, teachers, training all those folks that come into contact with um, young men of color, young um, vulnerable communities that have been harmed. I think that um, our ability to, we have a lot of the solutions, we're working on them, and I think that as we get more people more aware of what trauma is, how it um, presents, and how to respond to it, I think we'd be much better positioned to um, both intervene and prevent um, violence. So I would invest it in um, trauma training just across the board, across um, sectors. Jamil, what are you doing with your money? I have a list. <laughs> uh, but I think I would start also with training. Uh, aside from providing programs, training, in, and not in the traditional sense of like getting your continuing education training, but like hands-on training. Um, technology that allows for systems of, to collaborate. So if I have a family that needs to look for um, health care, but also needs social security benefits for the parents or grandparents, they don't have to go to 300 agencies to get that done. We can start collaborating in one way. And lastly, I would say um, prevention. We work in a remedial system where we always put a band-aid on a problem that it's already there, and we need to put more money on prevention. Ashby? I think, uh, per the point of most folks, the, the research and data 
Um, I think unless you can make people care about it, the money's there, but unless they care about it or know that you know, pre, unless you prove its you know the program's efficacy, there's no way they're going to invest in it. So I do think that that data um, is necessary. Um, outreach, outreach into com into further communities that don't know about our services, expansion of programs, and expansion of training and education for prevention. And I would take a little bit of each of their money and say <laughs> invest in advocacy. Right? We need advocates for our children and our families, our most vulnerable children and our communities. We know the seven communities that populate all our systems. So let's invest in that and eliminate poverty. So join me in thanking the panel.